sublimate and you will die your project we're going to talk about sublimation printing sublimation ink and I'm going to go into the details without getting too technical from the chemistry side point of view coming up Hi, I'm Roger and welcome to the room above the shop. I am up in the uh, loft here uh, a couple reasons. One is my table where I usually shoot my videos is completely stacked up with projects that uh, are in process that I need to get shipped out. As you can see here, there's no real room to uh, shoot video down there. That and it's blazing hot outside and it's air conditioned up here. So this is uh, the loft above the shop and if you haven't seen any of my other a little video shot from up here and you probably haven't seen this particular setting because I use this setting for a different channel but that's not important. This air conditioned up here uh, there's a two bedroom apartment up here and this is where we live before we build our house. So we won't get into that whole history of that. But getting back into sublimation printing I'm not actually going to do any printing demonstrations here. I'm just going to go into the definitions of what sublimation is, what sublimate means, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, I do have a little bit of a chemistry background. I am a retired electrical engineer electrician, but one of the things that was required in college, of course, was chemistry. And there is chemistry involved in electrical engineering, even though many people don't think so. But I got my start very early in life as a kid, back in the 1960s. For Christmas, I got a chemistry set. Now there's something that they don't give to kids anymore, especially like these here, is you had everything in there you needed, if you knew how to do it, to make some really dangerous things. Uh, you know, you could make gunpowder, you had everything there to do it. You could make explosives, uh, it came with an alcohol burner, a Bunsen burner, it came with all kinds of chemicals that they tell you not to just mix at random, but you kind of did it anyway to see what would happen. And there was occasional bang and boom from the basement, which would have my mom or dad running down there to find out what I did this time. Then, uh, of course, if that wasn't enough, then I got a set with a, came with a microscope. So now I could dissect things and cut things apart and look at them under a microscope. And yeah, they don't have uh, kits like that for kids anymore. It, they were dangerous and there were some accidents and Fortunately, I never got any chemical burns or serious injuries from it, but you learn about a whole lot of things the hard way that they just don't allow that stuff anymore, but it was fun back in the day. So I'm not a chemist, chemist. I'm going to go into the, uh, what sublimation is and how it works. Okay, the definition of sublimation is when something changes from a solid to a gas without passing through the liquid state. Um, an example of that would be dry ice. Um, pretty much everybody's seen dry ice. That's actually frozen carbon dioxide, so that's a solid. And when you put it out at room temperature, it doesn't become liquid, it just becomes a gas and you have carbon dioxide. Another example would be in the, for you folks that live down south, you're not gonna understand this, but up here in the north, you get these really cold days, so you've got snow and ice, and the temperature is way below freezing, but that snow and ice eventually sublimates and becomes water vapor and goes back up into the air. Now the opposite of sublimation is deposition or sometimes people call it desublimation or something will desublimate. That's when it changes from a gas back to a solid but never goes through the liquid state. Those are the uh, chemical definitions of it uh, from a, a chemist's point of view. Okay, I do not use a teleprompter, I do not read from a script, but I, I do have notes. So you may see me looking down at my notes every once in a while, little things that I highlight here so that I don't miss anything. Uh, this is somewhat of a technical explanation and I don't want to skip over anything here. So, we have different types of ink. You have the regular ink you go buy for your inkjet printer. It's a dye-based ink most of the time. They also make uh, pigment-based inks without getting into the, all the chemical differences on it, because that could be a really lengthy discussion. Uh, we can even get into whether a dye contains pigment or a pigment contains dye. We're not going to go there. 
We're just going to leave it to say that you have a regular inkjet printer and you go to the store and you buy ink, which is usually overpriced. That is a dye-based ink most of the time. Most of your inkjet printers are designed to use dye-based ink. If you try to put a pigment-based ink in an inkjet printer that was designed for dye-based ink, you're going to plug the heads up real quick. Uh, the difference being the molecular structure between the dye and the pigment. The dye is more soluble than the pigment is, and the pigment are actually little teeny tiny little balls that will get in and plug your heads up because they are usually larger than one micron. But we're not going to go into that part of it. We're going to get into now the difference between regular dye ink for your inkjet printer and dye sublimation ink. Okay, you also want to add here that sublimation is not a chemical change, it is a physical change. Uh, when you are changing a solid to a gas, the desublimation or deposition is when you're changing that gas back to a solid. For example, when candle wax burns, it, the paraffin in the candle combines with the oxygen in the air, it burns, and you have uh, carbon dioxide and H2O water. And that is a chemical reaction that is not sublimation. Okay, a couple other definitions of sublimation that is not chemical reaction but a physical change of state. Um, freezer burn. Everybody's experienced freezer burn. Uh, that happens when the uh, water, moisture content in your food or whatever, turns into a vapor under freezing conditions so it never sees a liquid state. It just goes directly from being frozen moisture to vaporized moisture and you end up with freezer burn. Another example would be uh, mothballs. Naphthalene, you know, buy them little mothballs or moth crystals to keep the moths out of your clothes or as we use them in our boat to keep the mice out of the boat in the winter. That sublimates at normal temperatures. The uh, naphthalene sublimates and becomes a vapor. And that's what creates that smell. So what is ink made out of? Here's a little chart, an example of uh, what's in ink. There is a great difference between regular inkjet ink for your printer and dye sublimation ink. So your dye sublimation ink is an ink that's printed onto uh, t-shirts, uh, polyester type t-shirts, and we'll get into why organic fibers don't work with it here in a minute. And as that is pressed in using heat, which is a, called an exothermic reaction, it causes that the solids in that dye to turn into a gas, which then permeates the polyester plastic type substrate, and then deposes or desublimates and penetrates those fibers and it becomes very permanent. It is not water soluble. It, after that is done, you, you won't wash it off. It's permanent. It, there's no going back. Uh, Regular inkjet ink, if I'm sure if everybody's had this, experienced this as an inkjet printer, you print something out, you've got this picture, or you have some text, or you've done something like this here, and you, it gets wet. And what happens? The ink runs. That's where laser printers have an advantage in office printing, because the, ink, the uh, toner doesn't run. But if you get uh, regular inkjet ink wet, it'll run. However, you cannot use regular inkjet ink for sublimation because of the composition of the ink and the dye. It will not transfer to your project. And while we're talking about projects a little bit, I'll get into why the dye will not sublimate into something like cotton. Uh, because cotton is an organic material, the chemical composition of cotton, and yes, Organic materials have a chemical composition, everything does. They're not compatible with letting those dyes permeate and depose into those fibers. And I'm not trying to get real technical here, it's just kind of pointing out the differences here. So if you are going to sublimate onto shirts, you want to have as high a polyester content as possible. For example, the t-shirt I'm wearing right here is 100% cotton. And that's what I actually prefer when it's hot like this because uh, cotton is a cooler fabric to wear than polyester because it it absorbs sweat and I sweat a lot and then that sweat evaporates and it cools you down whereas polyester does not absorb water quite as readily and it kind of tends to run off you before the shirt gets soaked and yeah we'll, yeah so 
that's the uh, differences there. Another one is uh, you may have seen people will sublimate onto wood, directly onto wood. It can work, however, that dye, as it tries to permeate and depose into those wood fibers, first of all, you need a very close grained wood if you're going to go directly on the wood. If you have an open grained wood, such as like red oak, that ink is going to bleed. The dye will bleed as it goes in, it'll spread, and you'll have ghosting all over. So you'd want to have a, a very tight grain, such as maple or birch, something like that. It also needs to be very, very smooth, very, very clean. A lot of people do is put uh, laminating paper on it first or a laminating sheet and that works very well because you can sublimate your photograph text, graphics, whatever, and since the laminate sheet is made out of polyester, it sublimates very well. Uh, another thing you may want to do, and I'll get into some of the projects here as I uh, get going here this fall and winter, where I will paint the wood first, then put the lamination sheet on, then do my sublimation on top of that. That's because a white background will always show better with sublimation than a off color. If you, uh, for example, you can't take a black t-shirt and sublimate directly onto it. You, there's some steps you would have to go into between there to do that, and it's rather complex. That's why most people use light colored fabrics. And there again, polyester. Next, I'm going to talk about paper a little bit. In the, uh, we're talking into the craft business here. I'm not talking about commercial operations and large scale things. Where, what you're going to do at home with your inkjet printer and your heat press and that type of thing. So, you have sublimation paper and you have regular copy paper. And some people have been successful using sublimation ink with regular copy paper. However, it's not really designed for that. The sublimation paper has a, a different chemical composition. We're back in the chemistry thing again. To uh, better enable that ink to transfer to your project when you put that heat and pressure on it and create that exothermic reaction so that it will depose onto your project. Shirt, wood, plaque, keychain, mug, whatever. Uh, which also brings up, you can't just go to the dollar store and buy a coffee mug and stick it in your mug press and try to sublimate to it. It has to have a specific coating on it. So forget that idea. That's not going to work. So getting back to the paper thing. Sublimation ink, sublimation paper, regular inkjet ink, regular office copy paper. Regular inkjet ink on that copy paper, regular paper for your office documents and for your projects, the sublimation ink on sublimation paper for your craft projects. They don't really cross. If you would, again, try to use sublimation ink and regular copy paper, and I know people have done it, I've seen videos of it, it does work, but it will not work as well as sublimation paper. If you print regular ink onto sublimation paper, it won't look very good for an office document, and it also won't transfer to your project, so don't even waste the paper trying to do that. Okay, so you've got your project printed out. It's sublimation ink on sublimation paper. And you want to put it on a t-shirt. Of course, I hope you mirrored that image because when you turn that over and transfer it to your shirt or project or whatever, if you didn't mirror it when you printed it, it's going to come out backwards. But subject to another video. So now, how do you get that onto your project? We well, use a sublimator. I made that word up. But you need heat. This uh, right, right here, this is a Cricut Easy Press. That's one way you could do it. The other way would be using a, uh, if you're doing t-shirts, use a t-shirt press. Uh, if you're doing coffee mugs, use a mug press. If you're doing plates, use a plate press. And caps, cap press. And I'll get into all those here in some future videos because I did buy a 5-in-1 uh, press, which I'm going to be doing a demonstration on here very soon. So there's an overview of what sublimation is and the actual definition of it. I know there's a lot of videos out there that say that just kind of gloss over this, but I thought I'd go into the uh, technical end of it a little bit. Maybe you need it for Jeopardy someday. Who knows? But if you got anything out of this, appreciate getting a thumbs up. Always helps the channel. Of course, always looking for subscribers. Otherwise, I'm Roger in the loft above the shop talking about sublimation. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.